the program today was sort of inspired by the book on Camp McCall that was jointly written by Tom McCallum and Lowell Stevens. The way we're going to do our program today, he will be doing the first part, which is the early days of Camp McCall when it started during World War II. I'll be telling about some of my recollections of the soldiers that were around Moore County and Southern Pines during the World War II when I was just a teenager, still in high school. And then the final part will be about the special forces training that's now going on at Camp McCall. But anyway, I think you'll be very interested in this, and with no further ado, I'll turn the program over to Tom McCallum. Tom? I'm honored to be on the same program with Norris Hodgkins, a dedicated public servant, and to be able to represent Lowell Stevens, himself a decorated special forces Vietnam veteran. Lowell Stevens will be pleased with your interest in Camp McCall. He was Fort Bragg's first Camp McCall range representative. He served there for 27 years after previously retiring as a master sergeant in special forces. While there, he adopted all visiting World War II veterans, listened to their stories, and was inspired by them. He suggested all the road and drop zone names to honor their units and campaigns. That's Lowell in the red circle there with his team in South Vietnam, a lot of which were indigenous people. The history of Camp McCall was created to perpetuate his feelings for this place. The Richmond County Historical Society is in charge of that task now. Two buildings at Camp McCall there have recently been named to honor his service. And this is Lowell as a young, very young, Green Beret. Lowell is known as the Camp McCall Historian. Camp McCall began as the Airborne Command, which was moved from Fort Bragg in 1943. Prior to the move, the command was training the 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions from Fort Bragg. The 11th, 13th, and 17th Airborne Divisions and many smaller units, such as regiments, battalions, and companies, received their basic training at Camp McCall. This history involves them and the training of their paratroopers and glider men. That includes the training of pilots of transport airplanes and the gliders they towed from Laurenburg Maxton Army Airfield, filled with men in training at Camp McCall. That airfield and Norwood Airfield here in Moore County were important to Camp McCall operations, relieved traffic at Pope Field. Why gliders? Think of them when you see the double tandem tractor trailer rigs as you see here on the highway today. It was all about delivering more soldiers and equipment to the battlefield towed in two gliders using only one powered aircraft containing paratroopers. Just like paratroopers from the airplanes, gliders were used to deliver troops silently behind enemy lines ahead of the arrival of ground forces. Here you see two gliders being towed by a C-47. Paratroopers were often widely dispersed on the battlefield in those days. Gliders could land more concentrated numbers of troops and equipment. Lowell had three main points he used to describe the significance of Camp McCall. They were his points, not an official U.S. Army version. The first was the history of the U.S. Army. There was only one major military installation named for an enlisted private. That is Camp McCall. Being a retired U.S. Army and Special Forces enlisted Master Sergeant, Lowell liked that fact very much. Second, in the history of the United States Army, only one military installation was created exclusively for training airborne troops, and that was Camp McCall. Third, since 1968, it is the place where every soldier who earned the right to wear the Green Beret underwent his special forces training, and that is Camp McCall. Camp McCall is, and always has been, a sub-installation or an extension of Fort Bragg. The origin of the accumulation of acres of land used for Camp McCall began back in the early part of the last century with ties to Moore County. In 1912, Frederick Taylor Gates, who had been the Rockefeller family's right-hand man in setting up the Rockefeller Foundation, purchased 22,000 acres in Richmond and Scotland counties. It was in large part because of a friendship with Walter Hines Page, who was a member of the prominent Page family in Moore County. Gates is on the left, and John D. Rockefeller is on the right. In those days, many wealthy Yankees 
came south to purchase large sections of land for hunting or farming in Moore, Richmond, and Scotland counties. The Rankin land along Drowning Creek in Moore and Richmond counties, for example, was among land bought for hunting. That same land today is leased for hunting by the Mecklenburg Hunt Club. In 1924, hunting cabins were used in use during World War II and remain in use today. They are now listed as some of Fort Bragg's historic structures and the only remaining pre-World War II structures at Camp McCall. And this is the Ranger Station. That's where Lowell Stevens had his office and it is listed on the National Historic Register. Gates chose to farm. Peaches were one crop which remains popular in the Sand Hills today. The Gates home was a large mansion located in Scotland County on Broad Acres Lake. It was used as an officer's club during World War II. Many of these farms and hunting lands, as well as surrounding land, were purchased by the federal government in the Sand Hills Land Project during the Great Depression in the 1930s, when farms were failing. That 58,000 acres was added to other lands which today comprise the Sand Hills game land in Moore, Richmond, and Scotland counties. Much of it was land depleted of nutrients by farming practices and timber cutting. Today, Camp McCall, through recent land purchases, now encompasses over 8,000 acres. However, the Army retains maneuver rights on the entire, entire Sand Hills game land. Since the use is mainly by Special Forces, they usually aren't very visible. When Fort Bragg needed to expand for airborne training, the land from the game land was a ready-made area for a new installation, and it was already federal land at no cost to the War Department. A few private parcels of land were also bought or leased. Not only that, Camp McCall and its airfield were only 12 miles from the Fort Bragg reservation line and practically in the center of a circle, including the Laurenburg Maxton Air Base to be developed and Nallwood Field right here in Pinehurst Southern Pines and Pope Airfield besides Fort Bragg. Other auxiliary airfields used in training were in Florence, South Carolina, Lumberton, and Richmond County. In 1941, the Carolina maneuvers were held in this area. It was the largest such military exercise in the history of the United States. During that maneuver, the Southern Pines Civic Club then opened its doors for the first time to soldiers as a USO club. Other USO clubs were in Aberdeen and Pinehurst. The Aberdeen USO club was exclusively open for the purpose of a USO club. A USO for African American troops was operated first in Pinehurst then moved to two different places in Southern Pines. During the 1941 maneuver, troops had left telephone wire in an area later to become Camp McCall. That fueled rumors then that the Army just might have some plans for the area later. Then on December 7, 1941, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor and we entered the war. Plans for construction began on Camp Hoffman in August 1942 to house and train up to 35,000 men. By comparison, it is interesting to note that the 1940 census in Moore County showed the population at just over 30,000. With the influx of people associated with Camp Hoffman, Aberdeen became a defense area eligible to build new housing. Between 1942 and 1943, the population of Aberdeen doubled. Residents were also asked to open their homes for renting to those involved at Camp McCall. This new camp was a marvel of wartime construction, which began by the Jones Company of Charlotte as general contractor on November 9, 1942. That was the day after Tommy McCall had been mortally wounded in North Africa. Four months later, on March 8, 1943, it was completed. Out of some 62,000 acres of game land and leased farm fields, in just a few months, they carved the training camp. That included 65 miles of paved roads, a 1,200-bed hospital, two containment areas with five movie theaters, most important, six beer gardens, a triangle-shaped airport with three 5,000-foot runways, a total of 1,750 buildings, which included three libraries and 12 chapels. Not to mention the rest of the game land area, which contained firing ranges for weapons and field maneuvers. It wasn't until the year 2008 that the area was officially cleared of all the shrapnel and debris. Did you notice there were at least twice as many chapels on base than beer gardens? I guess that was a good thing. Of course, there were also hard liquor and slot machines available in the officers club. The contractor for Camp Hoffman won a government award for completing the project in record time. The buildings were put together with a minimum of wood and a whole lot of tar paper. 
The buildings were hot in the summer, cold in the winter. They had pot belly, coal burning stoves for warmth. After all, they were meant to be just temporary buildings, like similar camps being constructed all across America. Notice the blouse pants on the paratrooper at the left. It used to be that only a paratrooper was allowed to blouse his trousers because they were special, and there probably was some utility benefit also. After all, this is the land of red bugs and ticks. This typical street scene in the division area shows coal bins in front of each barrack, as you'll see, they're neatly lined up. Orders were from somewhere on high. They had to be in line with each other at all times. That order became just too tempting to mischief-making soldiers who would move their neighbor's coal bin out of alignment just for fun. Knowing the military, there had to be, most likely, some military training logic involved in that order, such as the exercise the men would have getting to move nearly a ton of coal. While highly disciplined for battle, the men were always looking for fun. Many of the units had animal mascots, as you can see here, which ranged from bears to dogs to foxes. These mascots regularly jumped with the men. Can you imagine Fort Bragg allowing that to happen today? One bear, Joey, jumped enough times to be airborne qualified, and that could be at least five times. One ride in a glider, and you were qualified as a glider man. And just how did they get Joey to jump? Well, Joey liked beer. Besides the tar paper covered barracks for soldiers, larger buildings such as theaters like this, five of them in all, provided space for indoor classrooms as well as entertainment, such as USO touring shows. They also had the capability of being air conditioned. Religious needs were always considered during World War II at Camp McCall in several churches and chapels in which all faiths were served. There were two of these large churches on base in 10 smaller barrack-like chapels. Local residents were at times invited to participate in services on base, and chaplains and troops participated in services in some Moore County churches. All-purpose recreational buildings were available for sports, but they were well known for the community dances held there. Many young ladies from Moore County were bused their truck to camp to dance with the young men from all across America. In registering for one of the programs, Jill Gooding of Moore County said her mother, Nancy Richardson, told many tales about dances at Camp McCall, like when the girls went over in the back of army trucks and would come home with bleeding feet from the combat boots worn by the soldiers with whom they danced. Bleeding feet or not, the girls still invited soldiers to visit their homes in Pinehurst on Sundays. Bands from Camp McCall were very popular in the community where they played at many events. These young soldiers were also eager to challenge local athletic teams. Local boys did not always know the army teams had members who had played professional ball before coming in the army. The station hospital served military families as well as troops. Many children born there have birth certificates showing Camp McCall as their place of birth. Among those serving at the station hospital were members of the Gray Lady Corps. They were women from Moore and surrounding counties who were volunteers with the American Red Cross. At one time, Red Cross volunteers made most of the disposable supplies needed and used at the Camp McCall Station Hospital. Post headquarters, in addition to being in charge of operating and training at Camp McCall, was soon redesignated the Airborne Center for all U.S. Army Airborne Forces around the world at the height of its operations. Division headquarters was a busy place training men to become soldiers. One division followed another in training. The 11th Division went to the Pacific Theater of War and the 17th to the European. The 13th eventually went to Europe in January 1945, but men and units from the 13th well before that were continually being called up as replacements in the airborne divisions already in war zones. Although I'm not detailing day-to-day -day training, each man was trained in infantry skills with specialties as needed in addition to being able to parachute from airplanes and landing gliders to take the fight to an enemy. It was intense training with breaks for rest and relaxation. Each division underwent a final maneuver to prove its battle preparedness, such as the famous Norwood Maneuver for the 11th Airborne Division here in Moore County. Norwood Airfield later became the Pinehurst Southern Pines Airport and is now the Moore County Airport. Norwood, officially known as Norwood Army Auxiliary Airfield then, is the place where airborne divisions proved their worthiness in division size deployment. To satisfy General Dwight D. Eisenhower, on December 6, 1943, a massive parachute and glider assault was launched from four support airfields to seize Norwood Airfield. The attack was called an air armada, soon to be seen overhead in Europe during our invasion in France. Troops landed from five to 10 miles west and south of the airfield to begin the assault. It lasted for six days. For realism, 200 C-47s went from their airfields to the Atlantic Ocean 200 miles back to get there. 
They delivered 10,282 men by parachute, glider, and air landing, and many, many tons of material. There were more than 880 landings at Knollwood during the exercise, flying in supplies and reinforcements. Four men were killed in that exercise and 49 injured. The significance of that maneuver here in Moore County is that it is known in U.S. Army airborne history as the one that saved the use of airborne forces in the division-sized units. It kept intact the 82nd, 101st, 11th, 13th, and 17th Airborne Divisions during World War II and thereafter to this day. A month later, the 17th Airborne Division had its final maneuver also at Knollwood Airfield. This time, it was the Blue Army, and other units from Kamakal were the Red Army. This time, the Air Armada's route was extended to 300 miles. During the war, beginning in 1942, Knollwood Airfield was taken over by the Army Air Force's Training Technical Command. In doing so, it also took over the Pine Needles Hotel, its clubhouse, and grounds. Later, the Mid Pines Club and Parkview Hotel were taken over for office space and living quarters. The 107th Army Airways Communication System Detachment moved to Knollwood Airfield in May 1943. Shortly thereafter, the Knollwood Tower went on the air. The operations there were under the jurisdiction of the 1st Troop Carrier Command at Laurenburg Maxton Airfield for training of airplane and glider pilots. A soldier recording events in one report said, these glider pilots seem to be a pretty rugged crew as it is the usual thing for them to step out of a wrecked glider, brush off splinters, and climb into another glider and try again. In addition to control over the airport, that command also trained mechanics, radio operators, and specialists needed by the Army Air Force. There were some 400 officers and enlisted men there for that purpose. In September 1943, it also became a satellite field for Pope Field under the Troop Carrier Command. Until the end of the war, the airfield was continuously used by a variety of aircraft. In another exercise, a platoon of paratroopers from Camp McCall were dropped at the Pinehurst Racetrack in August 1944, three miles from Norwood, infiltrated through the woods, attacked, and took over the airfield. During the three years and four months, Camp McCall was training troops. Over 150 men died in that training. Such exercises increased the importance of what took place at Camp McCall during World War II. While airborne equipment and procedures may have been developed elsewhere, Camp McCall was often the testing ground for real-time situations. Each new division had a final maneuver, including the 82nd and 101st, which preceded them, that was used to test another new aspect of airborne capability. Whatever was tested, the results were spread from the center at Camp McCall to airborne forces around the world. In return, troops in the field would report back to the center about any difficulties looking for solutions. Camp McCall was the only U.S. Army installation for training, testing, and evaluating equipment, tactics, techniques, and procedures for paratroopers, glider men, and troop transport pilots and crews. In other words, training men for battle included using them to test new ideas as well. Paratroopers volunteered for duty and earned their wings at Fort Benning, Georgia. They got extra pay. Glider troops were often unsuspecting when they arrived at Camp McCall, discovering they had been assigned the glider units, few knew what a glider was and what they would be doing. They got no special pay. Later, many of the glider forces became paratroopers for the money and would rather risk parachuting than landing in a glider. After several fatal accidents, the gliders were referred to as flying coffins. Upon reaching the ground, all airborne troops were infantry soldiers. Artillery pieces were part of an airborne unit and were dropped by parachute near them disassembled into six sections, each with a different color parachute. The howitzers were then quickly assembled on the ground. Jeeps and other vehicles were often carried to the battlefield in gliders. During a crash landing, these vehicles, if pushed backward, could crush any soldiers seated behind them if they were not properly secured. Paratroopers in training at Camp McCall usually jumped from C-47 Skytrain transports over Moore and surrounding counties. One glider practice landing field was in Moore County, on the Rankin property along Drowning Creek, close to Thunder Road. On US-1 in Richmond County, you may have noticed the Glider Road sign, which led from that field to Camacall Army Airfield. Gliders also landed in a lot of farm fields in the area. The federal government always reimbursed farmers for any damage, and it still does. Keep in mind that airborne troops were new to the United States. Compared to safety measures today, the training of troops then could be very dangerous. They were being dropped from planes and landed in gliders with pilots who themselves were still in training. But the troops did not hesitate to do their duty. Gliders and C-47s were each cramped and limited in the number of troops they could carry. 
Uh, C-47 carried only 18 combat equipped paratroopers. Compare them to the giant transports carrying many more parachutes we see frequently flying over our house in Richmond County on the approach to drop zones at Camp McCall today. The rumble of those aircraft overheads is a constant reminder that Camp McCall is still a very active military base. It is reassuring to see and feel the power of our military forces. Gliders were abandoned after World War II in favor of helicopters which could extract troops as well as deliver them to the battlefield. During World War II, there was a technique by which gliders could be snatched from the ground. It was performed from many local farm fields where a glider landed. The pickup was practiced at the Rockingham, Hamlet, and Knollwood airports. A football field goalpost-like apparatus was set up, and an airplane dragging a tail hook could snatch the glider back into the air by the tower line, which was suspended on those uprights. Special Forces has trained in the use of such a system for recovering information from ground troops even today. Residents of Moore County often saw these large gliders overhead, usually being towed two at a time. There was a shortage of women's nylon stockings everywhere during the war, largely because a single 300-foot glider tow line contained enough nylon for 1,620 pairs of stockings. General Bill Yarborough, then a major, later a Moore County resident, was in charge of Operation Torch in North Africa, the first combat mission for the new U.S. airborne troops in this area. In the year 2000, he said, as we parachuted and crash landed into North Africa on 8 November 1942, the first dramatic chapter in America's call for airborne history was written. Much more has been written since. It was reported that Private Tommy McCall was the first U.S. paratrooper to die of wounds received in North Africa while at the new British hospital in Gibraltar. It is assumed because of that report received in Washington, D.C., that it is why he was chosen, because other of his comrades were actually killed in the North African conflict at the time he was wounded. Halfway through construction of Camp Hoffman, General George Marshall, also later a Moore County resident, issued an order February 8, 1943, for Camp Hoffman to be named Camp McCall in honor of Private Thomas McCall. By the way, the family name is technically pronounced May Cole, which I don't think any of us is going to adopt. The date for the dedication was set for May 1, 1943. At the dedication was Miss Alda McCall Newton, Tommy McCall's mother. To the left of the markers, we see it then. Left to right is June McCall, his sister, uh, Gerald, brother, and Bernard, brother. Gerald, 13 months later, was killed in the Battle of St. Lo, France, as his brother watched. And so was the only surviving son, Bernard. Tommy and Gerald, of course, were killed in the war. Camp McCall was one of the many military installations in America housing enemy prisoner of war, eventually some 400,000 POWs nationwide. There were 18 POW camps in North Carolina, including Camp McCall. German sailors rescued from U-boat 352 sunk off the North Carolina coast on May 9, 1942, were the first POWs confined at Fort Bragg. A coast of North Carolina, unknown to too many people, was an active World War II shipping battlefield not far from shore. Places in the South like Camp McCall were selected for prison camps because of their isolation, security, and a warm climate. We were a nice place to go. In contrast, at the time, when our troops were suffering and sacrificing on foreign fields, we provided many comforts and a safe environment for enemy prisoners of war here at home. Only six days after D-Day, June 6, 1944, German POWs began coming to Camp McCall. Their compound contained 52 tents, which would hold up to six men each, with two dining halls and a kitchen and a large latrine with showers and a laundry to serve them all. One mess hall even had a stage for live performances. A company of 55 U.S. Army soldier guards lived nearby in the same type of tents. The Geneva Convention, which we observed when others obviously did not, allowed the POWs to work in jobs which weren't war-related in camps and in surrounding communities. POWs were provided medical and dental care the same as our troops at the station hospital. For minor ailments, they had their own clinic. Twice a week, they were shown new movies. Most POWs at Camp McCall, sometimes up to 300, performed agricultural work, such as planting and harvesting crops, and cutting timber, in addition to working on base. For example, they harvested hay and corn for Pinehurst, and shook and stacked peanuts for Paul Clark of Kander, and picked local peaches. There was a shortage of manpower because so many local men were fighting in the wars overseas. At one time, there were 500 POWs working in Moore County from prison camps. But the war was over for these German POWs. The POWs were paid for their labor. Money went into personal savings accounts or into coupons to purchase items from a canteen. They were provided libraries, recreational equipment, 
and musical instruments for money gained from the proceeds of their prison canteen. They could also purchase, believe it or not, beer and tobacco products at the canteen. Their situation was better than being in war and more comfortable at Camp McCall, where they could even play soccer. Americans went so far as to allow the POWs to publish their own newspaper to keep the German spirit alive. During the war at Camp McCall, it was called the German Island. By the end of the war, it was renamed the Free World, probably with some prompting by their captors. Not everyone was happy with that situation. There were local complaints of POWs being coddled. One local soldier fighting in Europe wrote home to a newspaper that these POWs were still the enemy and should be regarded as such, and their comrades were still killing his comrades in Europe. However, the camps, like a camp call, had to be constantly checked for compliance with the Geneva Convention. As the war ended in 1945, the Airborne Center was moved back to Fort Bragg. A re-education program for POWs began, and those at Camp McCall were instructed on the values of democracy, even to the point of organizing theoretical political parties and holding elections on issues. Because we are Americans, our humane treatment of POWs reflects our true character as a nation. Those POWs had to realize that, and most likely were appreciative in learning something positive from the experience to take back home. To be an American, for one family, a lesson was learned. Well after World War II, being at Camp McCall was almost deja vu through the memories of a father to a son. In 1998, an Army NCO stationed at Camp McCall was the son of one of those World War II German POWs who was imprisoned there in 1944. That father certainly instilled in his son his feelings for America. The POW camp closed in 1945. Any remaining POWs here were transferred elsewhere. Unlike so many abandoned old World War II Army training camps, Camp McCall remains in use. The ghostly image of the World War II contaminant areas of Camp McCall is still visible from the air as a constant reminder of those times. The camp is mostly closed to the public today with restricted access monitored by security patrols.